All right, so today we're gonna talk about networking. And networking is one of those buzzwords that I kinda hate. <laughs> like, you gotta network, gotta network, gotta put yourself out there, gotta meet people, everyone gets a job based on who you know, not what you know, all that stuff. And I'm only gonna use it today because there's not really a better word <laughs> that encapsulates what I mean, but it has a lot of aspects to it. The first thing that I think we need to know about networking is that there are a lot of psychological reasons why we are sometimes averse to doing it and why we don't sometimes recognize its importance. And one of those is what is ingrained to us in high school, middle school, elementary school, middle school, high school, college, where it's called the just world hypothesis, or we think if we just get good grades and do well, and that will automatically be like discovered by the system and that will get a job that is commensurate with our skills and will develop financial security and uh, all that just by doing well in school. And it is, the world is kind of that way, but more not that way than that way. And one of the ways that or one of the reasons why it matters to put yourself out there and to meet people and to learn uh, new things is because you are de-risking the cost of collaboration, the cost of hiring, the cost of working together, the cost of finance. You're, you're de-risking the cost of getting somebody to invest in your idea. Uh, in that I don't just mean like a venture capital investment in a startup, I mean like putting time into devoting, say, human social relationships with you. Like I can introduce you to this person who will, uh, who knows something about what you're trying to do and I think you would have a positive interaction with them. So networking can mean a lot of things, not just going to a job fair and getting a job and asking, how am I going to get a job at this particular firm? Networking is a, it means a lot of uh, means a lot of things, and so I'm going to go through some of what I think are some of the barriers to networking that arise kind of from our own constructed view of the world. So why networking matters. <laughs> First. The first is accelerated aging. So if you're just in school and you learn about, we're very good in, in college about teaching you about the theory of things, like the theory of computer programming, the theory of art, the theory of chemistry, the theory of musicology, theory of political science. Uh, but once you get out of here, you need to know what the language is that people are actually using in that field, not just the theoretical underpinnings but how does that industry, interpreted broadly, operate? And this allows you to get the context that you need to have conversations and to even know what your career plans are. Let me give you an example. When I was applying for faculty positions, I was a career academic. Uh, I went from undergrad. I only had jobs in the university. Uh, first, I you know, worked in conference services one summer and then I was working in labs the next three summers of undergrad. Then I went to grad school and I got paid my graduate stipend so I didn't have a job outside of working in the lab. Then I was a postdoc and I, and I got paid by the postdoc position. Now I'm a faculty member and I, got, I get paid by the, by, the, by, the, um, uh, by the university to be an academic. You know, the only non-academic-y jobs that I had were working at my dad's tailored dry cleaner shop when I was a teenager and, uh, and cleaning up after orientation students. And these were all like way back in my history. They had nothing to do with my professional career, right? They didn't teach me anything about what it means to get a university lab financed or to get a company to pay for a scholarship for first year transfer students, for example. And so when I applied for faculty jobs, 
I was talking to these university administrators, department chairs and deans and senior faculty members, and they were like, what's your opinion of, how are you gonna get your work financed? How are you gonna get a grant? How are you going to engage, how are you, you know, what's the budget of your lab gonna be? Like, how much money do you need to have five graduate students or postdocs in your lab? Like, I'd never thought about these things. And it's not like I needed the first-hand experience, but I don't think I asked the right questions to people in my network, because I didn't really do any networking. I was just following the just a world hypothesis, where if I get good grades and publish good papers, that I'm gonna just somehow automatically know what I need to know when I'm confronted with the real world and as academia, as real world as academia gets, which is questionable, um, but, but that's, that's, where I, that's where I was. So I submitted 28 faculty applications, I got seven interviews and I got uh, one offer. And I got six rejections before getting that one offer. But now, and so it's reject, 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 then UCSD, yeah! which happened to be the best school that I, that I got an interview at, so I'm happy, happy about that. But anyway, um, I, I would say now that in my current position, I know a lot about university administration and lab administration and how to write a grant proposal and how to run a research lab and how to teach a class. And if I had some of that experience when I went into those job interviews, I might have gotten five out of seven offers or seven out of seven offers. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe. But did I need to be in this job for 12 and a half years before I you know, had this conclusion? No, I think if I had, if I had internalized the context that people in the job that I wanted were living in, ahead of time, I could have gotten halfway to where I wanted to be. Maybe I could have gotten three out of seven offers instead of just fumbling through and trying to sound all wise and stuff, even though I was just a, a fresh postdoc who never did anything but research. It broadens your perspective Networking allows you to meet people from varied roles and stages of their careers, and that enriches your understanding of your field. <laughs> Increased opportunities. So even in my own academic career, I found my PhD advisor by going to a talk and talking to him afterward. I met my postdoc advisor. She was giving a talk at my grad school and I weaseled my way onto her calendar for that day. I found the person at my university who was in charge of making her schedule and I said, can I please, please, please have 30 minutes with her? And so I presented my work and then she knew my name and then when it came time to apply to the lab, uh, she already kind of de-risked me because she had met me and it's not like the 10 applications from prospective postdocs that she gets per day. It allows you to improve your communication skills. So no matter how many times I talk in front of a group and I've probably at this point, I don't know, given 1500 class lectures like this, not to this class, because I've never taught Ravel 2 before, but in general. And you get nervous every time, at least I do, when you do public speaking. But your comfort level improves over time. And it's kind of flat, flat, you know, it kind of asymptotes. It kind of gets to that level of pure equanimity when you could, you know, talk to a crowd of 15 or a thousand or 2000 and it's all pretty much the same and I'm probably around that level now But did it start out that way? No the first hundred talks I gave first hundred random people that I introduced myself to at a conference It was boom, 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 like I needed a beta blocker Which is a cardiovascular drug that reduces your uh, I don't know your heart stroke volume or something 
lifelong learning. So making connections is a lifetime endeavor that continually enriches your professional life. One time I was at a conference, and this was one of these like swanky academic conferences that they happen to hold in Cancun. <laughs> And uh, it's, uh, it's a way where academics can pay one price to get access to the conference, but then all you can eat and drink <laughs> as well. And I don't know how they get away with this, but anyway, conference organizers held it at one of these places in Cancun. And I was, meet I was there with uh, a member of, the, uh, of my department who was also just above the junior faculty level at the time, just a couple years older than me. This is probably 2013, 2014. And he said, if you, this was back when, like pre-COVID, when travel was much more common in academia. And he said, if you travel once per month, and you make one good connection with a colleague uh, at this, this place, and then you've got 12 per year, and in 10 years, you've got 144 people that you can reach out to for various reasons. Now, you don't have to travel to do that. You can just go to a talk, go to a career fair, go to an industry visit, and it's the same, the same effect. What are some barriers to networking? So uh, social anxiety. Um, there is not a lot to, you can't just snap a finger and get rid of social anxiety. There's no pill that somebody can take that's like poof, no more social anxiety. Um, but there are some ways that you can manage it. And I'm somebody who has had a lot of issues with social anxiety. Uh, in my life, I don't consider myself an extroverted person, even though I'm up here talking to all of you right now and my job as a professor and as associate dean demands that I do a lot of public speaking. And in a way, it's kind of this weird performance art, but that's also the thing. I also like performance art. <laughs> so if I'm giving a talk, I want it to be interesting. I want people to be engaged. And that's kind of the way that I have figured out to be less introverted when I talk, even though it takes a lot out of me. After this talk, I'm gonna go sit in my office for half an hour and just breathe deeply. Just kidding, but a little bit, not half an hour, but a little bit. So introverted does not mean that you're shy. It just means you have to put a lot of energy into these social interactions. It's like someone invites you to a party or a dinner or something and you're like, mm. I just don't have the energy to be on for that. And then you say, no, I can't make it. And you can make up an excuse or not, but it's probably just better to say, no, that's just gonna be too intense for me. I wanna just chill out today, that's fine. Extroverted people, um, they may or may not be shy, but the fact is they're probably less likely to be shy, but for them, those types of social interactions don't cost as much energy they can introduce themselves to a random stranger and maybe it gives them energy. Maybe it doesn't even cost them energy. Maybe they, maybe they, uh, they just thrive on that kind of, of interaction, whereas an introverted person maybe doesn't. And you can go from extroverted to introverted in different days. Somehow that's how I feel. There's also a fear of failure. And you can sometimes have a concern, we can have the concern that an unsuccessful interaction will have a lasting negative impact. In my opinion, the importance of first impressions is really overrated. Really overrated, like, oh, darn, I blew my first impression. But then if you meet them again, like first impressions, like everybody knows that first impressions are are often bad, right? Because people don't they, don't, they don't, they don't know the other person's user's manual yet. And they don't, uh, they, haven't, they haven't broken the ice yet. So very often first impressions between people are not uh, necessarily positive. Like, why, why is this person even talking to me? Like, okay, I get it, no, no problem, no problem. 
We also tend to be more self-conscious than uh, of our own like perceived foibles than other people see in us. And this is really true in things like anytime you're putting yourself out there and you say you're giving a five minute presentation to a class or you're doing a job interview and you're showing part of your portfolio on your laptop and your laptop crashes or it doesn't hook up to the projector and it doesn't it the, your your slide your this there's this technical difficulty and then you get all flustered and you sweat and you blush and you think this person knows it's my my fault for being unprepared and not having backup slides and whatever that person I guarantee they don't think those things. They don't care. Everybody has been in those positions before where there is something about that first interaction that is so easy to get over. Think about your best friend. Your best friend. What was your first impression of them? My best friend in school, okay, granted we were seven years old, but my best friend from an elementary school, his the first thing he ever told me when I, I was drawing with a bunch of crayons in my fist and I made a big arc and he goes, that's no way to make a rainbow. Not the best first, first impression. And then I think whenever there's like a bad impression later that I give or that somebody else gives, and then I, I, I just set the clock and I'm like, how does my opinion of that person or how does that person, how does my relationship with that person change over time? Let me give you an example. And this is a first impression I think that I still got wrong, but I think it's probably gonna improve. A couple weeks ago, I went to a networking event from my wife's MBA class at Rady at UCSD. And the dean of the, the, uh, the business school was there. And I'm an associate dean for student, students. And a few, a week earlier, we had exchanged emails about some, some deanly thing, <laughs> some program that, that the engineering school and the business school were involved in. And so, I wanted to network and I wanted to introduce myself to her. And so the first thing I said was, oh, hi, my name is Darren Lepome. I'm Associate Dean for Students in Engineering. I think we sent this, we exchanged emails the other day and she didn't remember. So then the, the first 30 seconds of the conversation were, Oh, it was about this, and that was about this, and it was about this. No, I don't, I don't remember. And it, we just wasted that whole time because I'm like, I, I, I put myself in a position where we, we were not talking about anything meaningful, but some administrative email. And it's just like, like another way to, to like not introduce yourself to somebody is, oh, we've met before. Did we? Did we? I, I don't remember. I don't, I don't remember. I don't remember that. Or, or um, it's nice to meet you when it's, oh, we've actually met before. And both of those interactions are so deflating that you just, instead just say, it's good to see you. Anyway, but I promise that even though that's your first impression, that stuff will disappear with continued interactions. You just don't want to give away any points unnecessarily. Okay, talking out of both sides of my mouth here, but. All right, another thing, imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome, um, sometimes called the imposter phenomenon, is when despite doing well in school and you think you don't deserve to be somewhere. You think that everyone else is more prepared than you are. Uh, and this can, especially if you are from a situation where people around you, um, where you don't know how to like calibrate, right? Like, so when I got into grad school and I called my, or called my dad, who is a career tailor dry cleaner. And I said, oh, I got into su such and such a place, which is a, a good school. And he's like, 
He's like, oh, that's great. But when do you find out if you got in? <laughs> I'm like, I did get in. He's like, oh, so when are you going to get your acceptance letter? That is my acceptance letter. Like, uh, well, when is it going to be for real? <laughs> it just didn't like compute. And so I didn't, uh, it, it was like being in a, in a scenario where, where there weren't other scientists and engineers and even like a ton of college educated people around, um, it was, it was like being plunked into undergrad and I felt like there were a lot of people who spoke in a much more like aristocratic way and I kind of thought that like I don't belong here like I'm not I, I it, it was just it's just kind of a weird feeling I'm not even saying that I like had a bad case of the f f imposter phenomenon but it's definitely a thing it's definitely a thing that is very common and it discourages people from uh, from reaching out and developing their uh, their social contacts oh yeah this is really important never compare your insides to someone else's outsides so People, the way that people present themselves is not quite the Instagram version of themselves, but it's almost the Instagram version of themselves, right? They spent however many minutes getting ready in the morning, but they're not broadcasting to you all the doubts and uncertainties in the inner dialogue that you have, maybe, or you might have. So if someone says, I'm really, you know, I, I got an A on this and I'm really confident about this and it seems that I know all this stuff, um, that's kind of like the borderline Instagram, <laughs> right, version of what they're, what they're thinking about, right? It's the, it's the somewhat more curated thing. Because if you go the other way, like, oh, I'm, I, I don't know what I'm doing, I'm so, so, uh, so clueless, blah, 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 like, no one wants to hear that either. So, I don't know, it's <laughs> take it for what it's worth. All right. There is sometimes uh, some, some uncertainty about the right way to network, not knowing if the network of, networking effect will, uh, will make it hard to, not knowing what the outcome of a networking effort will be can make it hard to make to take the first step. What I would do here, anytime you have a social interaction where there is the underlying assumption that you're going to get something out of the interaction. In my own case, it would be I'm going to a federal funding agency and I'm going to talk about my research and I want to get the program manager to get excited about it so that I could potentially get some money. Of course, it would have to go through peer review and all that stuff, but it has to start with the program manager. And if the goal is if I don't get the money, it's a failed interaction, and that's the wrong way to think about it. The right way to think about it is if I delight this person in this interaction with my ideas or make them feel smart, make them feel part of the process of going back and forth about this idea, then I've increased the probability of getting the money, but delighting the person is much, much easier to achieve than getting the money. And so if you set up your own rules for success in these types of engagements, you can win every time. So if it's just to, to you know, delight them, not that you're just going to tell, you know, riddles and stuff, like it has to be relevant, um, but that can be a strategy to avoid the immense pressure that we put on ourselves when we meet people from whom we can potentially get something professionally. So almost by definition, when you're networking, you, you're networking when you're a student, you are, and even among peers too, even among peers, there can be a, a 
hierarchy. There can be some status ladder where the person has some kind of status that they need to share with you and let you into the organization. This last bit, lack of self-awareness, not knowing one's own value can make it hard to articulate it to others. And this has to do with the, uh, the imposter syndrome or imposter phenomenon. You can overcome this by uh, preparation. I think that it is useful to practice having words come out of your mouth before you speak them in a high pressure situation. I even think it's important for the sense of motor control and repetition of having the words form <laughs> in your mouth and in your uh, whatever vernica's area in your brain because Okay, let me back up. When you watch the news, like you watch CNN or something, and there's some, or a politician, and there's some talking head, or you're listening to a podcast, and there's somebody just talking, 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 and all the sentences are coming out in complete sentences with punctuation, and you're like, I don't talk like that. I kind of talk in a meandering way, and I'll eventually get to the point but I'm not that eloquent or whatever. Well, neither are they. They just said that same thing a hundred times, so it's baked in, right? Sometimes they might have even written it, like in an article or written it in some notes, and they can just repeat them. Just like debate prep, if anyone did like, uh, I don't know, like mock trial or model UN or something, or you're watching a political debate and you want to have some points that you can just rattle off. And it's not that it's, I don't mean that your points need to be BS like a politician's points are, but it helps to have that stuff in your back pocket where you can just uh, talk this uh, I mentioned already. Um, I don't know if The Simpsons is still popular, uh, but there was an episode. So Lisa Simpson is the very uh, smart eight-year-old daughter who corrects Homer all the time. And he goes, ah, thanks for correcting me, Lisa. People love it when you correct them. <laughs> Um, telling someone you met them before, exchanged emails, etc. Like just, just clear introduction. Hi, how are you? How are you doing? How are you? Uh, my name is so and so. I'm a first year transfer student at UC San Diego. Um, I'll talk about some prompts that you can use when talking about somebody in an industry that you uh, that you uh, that you desire to get into. You can use the concept of small goals and working your way up. So you start with low risk situations and gradually move up to build confidence. So what are, what, are, what are low risk situations? Talking to each other, talking to me, talking to your TAs or discussion leaders. A support network, uh, leverage your existing relationships for introductions to people and practice empathy. So we are all like just every day we're getting to that, we're getting older, we're getting more wise, getting older, getting more wise. There are people in front of us in line who a few years ago were back when, where we were and you can, you can picture them as a younger person and imagine the fact that you are just doing what they did, that you're doing what they did. Remember that everyone has been in your shoes. Most people are open to making new connections, especially because they came to the event. <laughs> they are, they're there to meet you. Even though we're in academia and most of what I've talked about has been about 
getting to learn about a new industry or a job, um, a career type that you are interested in, there's a lot that you can do here. So finding a mentor, initially your advisors and professors and TAs and discussion leaders are your first network. Also underrated part of networking is that you are all now classmates, but in a couple of years, you will all be peers, coworkers, colleagues. Your department will have connections with relevant industries. I don't mean heavy industries, industries broadly interpreted. Find out where, find out who's supporting your uh, professor's research. Take advantage of the fact that we are an R1 institution. If you are working with a with a professor on a project, try to learn about the funding environment. See if they're getting company funding. Sometimes they are, and sometimes they can introduce you to those people. Alumni. A lot of times the label that we have as a UCSD alumnus is a very powerful motivator of getting people to become interested in your professional development. So we have alumni events, and these are rich sources of uh, opportunity and advice. Next, networking is sort of like textbook learning. It's not just about getting something, it's about getting information. It's about tapping, it's about getting a window into a field that you don't know much about. For example, unfamiliar terminology. Every field has jargon and you won't understand it until you engage with people who use